President Trump has been making history since the first day of this administration. I know I speak on behalf of the entire cabinet and of millions of Americans when I say congratulations and thank you. I'm deeply humbled as your vice president to be able to be here. I'm here today because I stand with President Trump. It's the greatest privilege of my life to serve as vice president to President Trump. He's a man of his word. He's a man of action. Yes, sir, Bob. Anyway, welcome back to Harbaugh. Publicly, Vice President Mike Pence is Donald Trump's most devoted cheerleader. Privately, according to The New York Times, the vice president and his chief of staff are ruffling some feathers. It reports that Republican officials now see Mr. Pence as seeking to exercise expansive control over a political party ostensibly helmed by Mr. Trump, tending to his own allies and interests, even when the president's instincts lean in another direction. It adds Mr. Pence and his influential chief of staff, Nick Ayers, or Ayers, Ayers, I guess it is, are unsettling a group of Mr. Trump's fierce loyalists who fear they are forging a separate power base. Aware of the concern, the vice president's chief of staff recently told a Republican ally, catch this, that one reason Pence is so effusive in his public remarks about Trump is to tamp down questions about his loyalty. I think that guy's in trouble right now. Anyway, Pence's spokesperson disputed the Times report, saying in a statement that the president and vice president work together to develop a political strategy and that the two hands work hand in hand. Anyway, from where I'm joined by Jeremy Peters, a reporter with The New York Times and an MSNBC contributor, and McKay Coppins, a staff writer for The Atlantic. Hey, McKay, this is great reporting about this. Tell me about this whole story about how, you know, that this guy actually said, this chief of staff actually told somebody, I'm acting very dutiful and supportive of the president, so they won't think I'm undermining him, so they won't think that. I never heard anybody talk like that to the press or to anybody. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 a crucial element of Pence's survival uh, strategy in this White House. I wrote a profile of Pence last year, and what I heard time and time again was that he had to play, he has to play the public loyalist uh, to Trump in order to be able to uh, have the latitude that he wants to get things done, that he wants to get done. And, and Trump is somebody who is susceptible to that. If he sees Pence on TV, you know, singing his praises, talking about how great he is, he's he's like likely to say, OK, well, that guy's in my camp. And it gives Pence the ability to kind of maneuver behind the scenes in a way that helps himself. Well, I don't know if I, more, if I know more about politics than either of these guys, but I'll tell you, in this count, I might. If I heard this guy kissing up to me the way this guy does in public, I'd be saying, this guy has made the biggest bet in history on me not being president soon and he being president. <laughs> That's the bet he's making that I want to be able to appeal to the party that has been won over by Trump when the time comes. That's what I would hear if I were Trump. Your thoughts again on that? Okay. Yeah, yeah, no, there's no question. I, it, I, I'm told that Pence has been waiting in the wings for this entire time. I mean, I, I was talking to a Trump loyalist, former advisor last year, who said Pence is not a guy who's going down with the ship. If he sees an opportunity <laughs> to jump, he's going to jump, and, and, and he's going to yeah. take that opportunity. And well, he's high up on the poop deck anyway. Jeremy, <laughs> your view about this motive of this guy, because he acts sort of like a character out of Da Vinci Code sometimes. He's so religious, so pious in his devotion. It's like he's, light, he's a, a grand, uh, some kind of grand vizier for Trump, not just a vice president. He lights candles in honor of this guy. You know, it's strange. You can smell the incense when he's talking about the president. It's, oh, he's overdoing it. And Trump you know, likes that? That's I, I've been to enough of these speeches of, of Pence's where he just lays it on so thick. You have to ask uh, yourself, like, does he really mean this? Does he think that the nobody president likes isn't anybody that much? Eventually, no. And and, and, and and Trump is not a stupid guy. He can smell a phony. And I think that, yeah. that sooner or later this is going to catch up with Mike Pence. And I'll tell you why. It's not just that there are Republicans who are concerned, as my colleagues reported in this terrific piece, that that, that Pence is building his own power center within the Republican Party. I've heard from Republicans, especially Republicans on the religious right, that they're kind of tiring of Pence. They don't see anything that special about him anymore. He suffers from the comparison to Trump. But he talks like Trump. them. He, he talks, talks like, like he's them, at a religious event or like with that piety. But, but, 
But what Trump has taught them, Chris, is that they don't need someone who talks like them. Donald yeah. Trump has given the religious right more than Ronald Reagan, George Bush, and George H.W. Uh, Bush ever yeah. did combined. And now that Again, they've spent today, this year... They moved yeah, the yeah. embassy today for them. Yeah. Ex exactly. So they look at Mike Pence and they say, well, would we have gotten all this with Mike Pence? And they're not so sure. It's like after this year of living dangerously with Trump, it's like, you know, being, being driving a station wagon your entire life and then suddenly getting behind the wheel of a Bentley and you realize, like, wow, this is really fun. And it, and it works. And that's exactly what's happened here. And it really undercuts this notion that Pence is somehow the guy, the adult in the room Room who's keeping Trump in line because he's, he's just really not on these issues that are important to the religious right. Well, McKay, back in uh, January, you reported that a few days after the release of the Access Hollywood tape, Pence contemplated a coup. You write, Pence made it clear to the Republican National Committee, the RNC, that he was ready to take Trump's place as the party's nominee. Tell me about that reporting because I've grown up politically in a world where if you pop up when the other guy's weak, that other guy or woman never forgets it. They never forget that when you had a bad couple of days after Access Hollywood, for example, that guy tried to seize an opportunity. You never forget that for the simple reason you know that at some point later you'll be weak again and he'll be there to, to ditch you. Your thoughts? Exactly. How'd you get they that? Tell me about your reporting on that. Well, I talked to several Republicans familiar with the situation. Obviously, I couldn't, I can't go into more specifics because of the sensitivity of the issue. But, but th that is the moment that a lot of Trump loyalists point to. That moment after the Access Hollywood tape came out, that weekend was a testing ground for Trump aides and allies. Sure was. All of them talk about it constantly. If you were with Trump at that time, then you were a true loyalist. And that's why a lot of people have been wary of Pence from the beginning, because they think that, that for that moment, for that, that day or two, Pence wavered in his loyalty to Trump, and they, they're just waiting for the moment that that happens again. Well, Corey Landowski, the president's fired campaign manager, is now going to work for the vice president's PAC, his political action committee. That's Pence's. A Republican source told NBC News that Trump asked Lewandowski to sign up. Another Republican source told NBC Lewandowski's arrival was meant to send a signal that while Trump and Pence are aligned, Trump is the boss. How do you read that, Jeremy, that he put a guy, a mole in there? I, I read it, Chris, as the, the vice president's office trying to undermine the report of my colleagues. So basically, this oh, came really? out about 10 minutes after the report mm. posted on NYTimes.com. And what, what happened was basically the, the Pence forces within the White House wanting to signal that they are all in alignment with, with President Trump and his, his team. So basically, Corey Lewandowski is, uh, joining Pence is supposed to signal that all is well. And this was done as a response to the piece. Let's talk about iconic politics, because I think a lot of politicians are driven by pictures they remember growing up politically, and they try to match up to them and do the same smart move. Let's talk about Jerry Ford and how he replaced Nixon in 1974, when Nixon was canned, basically. Ford has spent a lifetime supporting Nixon. I did respect that part way back in the beginning with the Nixon fund and the checker speech and all. So Nixon had a good memory of the guy. But for a while there, it looked like Jerry Ford, as leader of the Republican Party in the House, was really the Republican Party leader when Nixon was not. Is Mr. Pence trying to ape that in that manner, try to become Mr. Republican under Trump so when Trump goes, he'll be seen as the natural successor like Hillary was uh, last time on the Democratic side, the natural successor? Your thoughts? You know, I spoke to a senior Republican Senate aide last year who said, when we all talk about on, in the media about which scandal is finally going to align Republicans on the Hill against Trump, that's the wrong yeah. question. What he said is, the question is, when are the Republicans on the Hill going to decide that they're ready for President Mike Pence? And that's when they're going to make the decision to turn on Trump. Now, I don't know if that's true, and maybe that situation has evolved since last year when he told me that, but I do think that Pence has clearly laid a groundwork and is continuing to lay the groundwork for him to be the party champion, the one who can unite all the different camps of the Republican Party in case something happens to Trump. Let me go to Jeremy with my least nice question I've ever put to you, Jeremy, the hardest question, <laughs> to which I don't know there is an answer, but I'll ask the wrong guy, you. Who on the Democratic side right now in 2016, looking forward to, uh, around 2018, looking forward to 2020, who could beat Mike Pence? In the states I that matter, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan, who could beat Mike Pence in a one a mano a mano race that November? I could think of any number of the presumed Democratic frontrunners that would be very strong against Mike Pence, because I don't think we should assume that Mike Pence would be a very strong candidate if Trump 
were no longer in office and Pence oh. became the president for whatever reason. I think, I mean, look at look what happened with Gerald Ford. You mean he would it, suffer? What he, what, yeah, I think he would suffer, yeah. And what if he pardons Trump if it came to that? That would be a, a huge blow to his popularity. I think you could yeah. be looking at a similar situation like that. And I think that there's going to be a certain amount of Trump fatigue if, indeed, there is a, a situation where he exits office early. And people aren't going to want to go with the, the guy who's run around the country singing Trump's praises and declaring fealty, fealty to him, saying, dear leader, thank you so much for your service and, and how wonderful a leader you've been. I'm sure glad I told you it was a hard question. You had the obvious answer. He will be tainted just the way Jerry Ford was tainted by the pardon, even being too close to Nixon. And because after a major scandal, people do want to switch parties. You're thinking about that, McKay. Is Mike Pence a national figure that could win a presidential election against the Democrats? Does he have the heft? You know, it's funny. You talk to Republican elites, especially last year and the beginning of this year, they would all say, oh, Pence would be such a better candidate, such a better president. I'm not sure that that consensus is going to hold, especially with the kind of scandal that would take down Trump or even just cause him not to run for reelection. It, it, it is not clear to me that Pence would, uh, would emerge unscathed from that situation. Though, Here's the one caveat I'd add. A lot of it depends on the way that he breaks with Trump, right? If there's a moment that Pence dramatically breaks with Trump or, or turns okay. on him. A lot of people might see that as, a, you know, forgive him for the, the previous things that he's done in support of Trump. I don't know, but I think that that might be the calculus there. Okay, this is for you and not for Jeremy, because Jeremy can't do a straight reporter question, but I'm going to give it to you anyway, McKay. I don't know you as well, but here we go. Who wins a <laughs> national nomination fight in the primary season in 2020 if it comes down to Mike Pence and Nikki Haley? Who wins? <laughs> Jeez. I have no <laughs> I, I, I have no idea. I'm not. I'm, I'm not picking. I'm betting on Nikki. Yes. I'm betting on the ambassador. Anyway, Jeremy, you want to take a shot at that? It's, it's a free fire I, shot there. I, Who looks I better? That, I think that a Republican that has a, a, as, as much distance as possible from Trump is probably the one in a situation like that, if, if for whatever reason Trump leaves office early, who's going to have the best shot. Now, Nikki Haley has her own political brand. Mike Pence's political brand right now is so wrapped up in Donald Trump's that there is no daylight between the two of them. Nikki Haley's been pretty exquisitely, clever. And, and, exquisitely yeah. answered by a straight reporter. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jeremy Peters <laughs> and McKay Cobb.